So as it was shared last Sunday, the today, um, this is going to be fun. Um, I'm preaching today, and this is the last time I'll be preaching with you all. Because next Sunday is my last Sunday here before Katie and I move to Clarksburg. Uh, pray for Katie. She actually starts her job tomorrow, and that is definitely terrifying because it's a new adventure for her. But it's been a very weird couple weeks because as we process the logistics, as we process the house, the, all the fun stuff, we're also having to process our emotions. And our emotions have been up and down because we're thankful for where we are going, we're excited for where we're going, but it's also painful as we say goodbye, as we say farewell to you all just for the meantime. We'll see each other again in eternity. Hopefully you'd like me enough to submit in eternity with me, but that's whatever. But it's been very interesting because we came here five years ago knowing a few people, a few close friends, and that few close friends became a big faith family that we will cherish forever. And as I started thinking through just different things, I jotted down a, a few things and just some memories that I have. And one, the first one, Tony can't take no for an answer. He asked me four times if I'd come be a youth pastor. I told him no four times. But the fifth time I finally said yes, so he, he finally got that. Uh, but other, other than that, uh, search committee, Dave Everly, was the most terrifying man I've ever met in a search committee meeting. Uh, I was deathly afraid of him. I don't know if he was doing it on purpose to try to see what I was like, truly, but I walked away with my tail tucked, and I was terrified of him. Now I know he appreciates the candy aisle and Hobby Lobby as much as I do. We run into each other frequently there, and so now I know he's just a big teddy bear who likes that, and we love making fun of the Cincinnati Reds together, even though he's a Pirates fan, but it's okay. Uh, you guys know that we'll, it's not church unless Gary Sampson's holding the door or Patsy's there to give you a hug. And like I said earlier, Patsy needs a hug from all of us this week. I always remember that my very first time ever preaching here, back in 2017, Chad Yoho walks up to me with this most encouraging look on his face. That should be my first uh, warning. He wraps his arm around me and says, don't suck. Little does Chad know, before every single sermon, I stand before you and think to myself, Scott, don't suck. So thank you for that, Chad. If he ever walks up to you with an encouraging look on your face, run away. I one time even told him that I look at him for his encouraging looks during worship, and now I don't do that anymore because now he makes faces at me. I'll always remember when Chad, Tony, Brett, and I went to Otterbein to watch Marietta and Otterbein play, and that's the first time I ever went to a Marietta basketball game. And Hugh Buzzard... Not superstitious, but office fans, he was a little stitious. He noticed the fact that they were losing terribly, and this was my very first game ever attending, so at halftime he said, Scott, you got to go. <laughs> Thanks, Hugh. I always remember the first time I ever stood upstairs in the, the summit or the vine, and I just thought to myself, I have no idea what I've gotten myself into. This is definitely terrifying. We're standing in the sound booth of Mike Corner as his daughters, Emma and Audrey, led worship. They were singing All the Poor and Powerless. I'll never forget this. I can never hear the song the same way again. And Mike's supposed to be running sound, but instead is harmonizing with his daughters in the sound booth. And I'm witnessing one of the most purest forms of worship I've ever seen in another human. It was amazing to watch a father and two daughters worship together. Spending time with the most amazing students in the Middle High Valley, track meets, football games, soccer games, softball games, cross-country meets, basketball games, band competitions, recitals. And being completely and utterly confused during volleyball, I still don't know exactly all the rules there. Also during cheer competitions, sitting next to Mike, not knowing what's going on. But also I need to retract something that Brett said three years ago. Cheer is a sport. I saw how y'all looked at Brett when he said that. I want to go out on a good note. So, Mike, I'm afraid of Anda. I want her to love me forever, so that's why. I will always remember the feeling of anticipation. If you know Ray Clow, when Ray Clow starts walking towards me, I just don't know what to expect. I don't know what he's going to say, and I don't know how offended I will be. I'll always miss getting texts from Sue Kuhn during Marshall football games, go herd, and the greatest college basketball team in the history of basketball, Duke. And I'll always miss Tobe Offenberger passing out mints that I know for a fact he's never tried for himself. I'm pretty sure he bought them in the 80s in a surplus store, and he's been passing them out ever since. And I thought one time I could take him home for Sadie to use as chalk on the sidewalk, but whatever. <laughs> and we've all walked together through life with some of the greatest group of friends I've ever had, whether it's on the disc golf course, whether it's in a, at the coffee table, uh, traveling through the mountains together, whatever it is. We've watched our kids grow up with other kids from this church. Uh, fun fact, uh, our two daughters are pledged to be married to the post weight boys, and if they keep popping out boys, we'll, I guess we'll keep popping out girls. So <laughs> arranged marriage is not a bad thing in today's world, I guess, right? 
the families are good. <laughs> Knowing that our kids are cared for every single Sunday, but also through the week by amazing caregivers and loved ones. Convincing the Scottish missionary partner's children that Mark McCain was secretly Shrek. That happened. And now I'm affectionately known in Scotland as Donkey because of Mark McCain. <laughs> when I sent a message to Pete Stewart and Pete Beltoni the other day, I just explained that I'm leaving. I finished, it off, finished off the statement with Donkey out. So they loved it. But serving alongside Gretchen, who I'm deathly terrified of still, uh, who I always want to make sure she's happy and, I'm ha and it's always, always good. She's the one, real one running the church. And then serving alongside Brett, Brian, Brenda, Jennifer, Rebecca, Becky, Katie, and forever my friend. I'm not going to look at him. These last five years, my pastor, Tony Foreman. But for all those things, I'm very thankful. But today, I'm not going to spend time reminiscing because we're supposed to be here looking at God's word. And that's what I want to do right now. Because it does bring up a good question that I want to look at today as we spend time in Philippians 4. I want to ask the question this morning, while yes, I have things to be thankful for, but there's a deeper reason I'm thankful today. But do you have a reason this morning to rejoice? Is there gratitude in your heart this morning? Is there, in the very depths of your soul, do you sense gratitude, that pure nourishment of your soul that considers all the things around you, all the things within you, all the things before you, and you see all the goodness of God, and it creates within you a heart of worship and the ability to rejoice? Do you have that gratitude deep in your soul? Paul writes these words in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I, Paul, rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. As I read over Philippians chapter 4, and hopefully you read the same thing, all I sense from Paul is an overflowing abundance of gratitude and thankfulness. You can see just oozing off the page all that he's thankful for, all the things that he considers in his life. But I have to ask the question, how does Paul end up in that position? How does Paul end up with the ability to say, I am good no matter the circumstances. I am content in whatever comes my way. How does he end up there? Because as I look around the world today, I think you all would agree, gratitude seems like a lost art. Gratitude seems like a lost art. So many things we're not thankful for. But the noise around us is loud and it's full of complaints, it's full of misery, it's full of pain the war, about the world, the economy, politics, pandemics, wars, all of it. Such noise, a negative noise. But let's be honest for a second this morning, we can all agree that the noise is not just over there. The noise is also right here. It's not just the world complaining about all the things. We too as believers find ourselves complaining. We complain about life. Complain about our kids, you can admit it, it's okay. Complain about your spouse, don't point at them. You complain about your job, you complain about sports, about your bosses, about your pastors, our churches, our politicians, and the list keeps going on and on and on. For a people who have an eternity of reasons to be grateful, we have a million reasons to complain. It's insane. Charles Spurgeon once said, as long as a man is alive and out of hell, he cannot have any cause to complain. I love that. We're alive and not in hell, so what are we complaining about? But yet we do. The people who have been set apart by redemptive work of Jesus, the ones who have been marked by the blood of the Lamb, the ones who have been given a unique purpose and mission for the spread of the gospel and the kingdom-building work right here, with eternity kept and secured in the palm of the hands of Jesus, sound too much like the world around them. A simple scrolling of Facebook, a simple scrolling of Instagram, we can see where this is happening but also to examine your own heart. What are the things you're thinking about? What things are you currently complaining about? 
And sadly, the tune we sing is nearly indistinguishable from the tune of the world around us, when in reality, the Christian should be the one governed by supernatural contentment and a heart that's overflowing with gratitude. Paul makes profound statements in these first few verses. He says, I want you to continuously rejoice. I want you to rejoice always. And then if it was enough, he says, and I say it again, rejoice. He commands them to rejoice continuously. He calls upon them to be free of anxiety and worry. He calls them to be people of prayer and people of thanksgiving. He calls them to meditate and center their minds and their hearts on what is true what is honorable, what's lovely, what's just and pure. And then he arrives at this statement in verses 11 through 13, and he says, I have learned the secret. I have learned how to be content in no matter the circumstances. I know what it means to be in need. I know what it means to have plenty, but I will be content in every situation. And then he says this statement that we all know, I, Paul, can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. According to Google, Contentment is a state of happiness or satisfaction. According to what I believe about the Christian faith, I would argue that it's a state of eternal joy that comes from a complete satisfaction in Jesus and nothing else. Complete satisfaction in Jesus that springs up an eternal joy. But the question again must be asked, how does Paul arrive at this state of contentment? Because we all know this is not something that happens overnight. We don't just wake up and be like, I'm going to be a positive person today. Yeah, right. As soon as you say it, you're going to be driving to work. Someone's going to cut you off and you're going to flip them off, right? It's just, you can confess it. It happens. Or you yell at them. Or you yell, God bless you or whatever. God bless you is a great way to insult somebody peacefully, right? We do that all the time. But think about this. It does not just happen overnight. Paul did not just transform overnight. This is years and years of pruning and discipline. You need to remember who Paul was. Paul was Saul of Tarsus, whose life mission was to destroy the church of Jesus. He was a zealous religious leader in the Jewish faith, and his mindset was, I must end this movement. So he would go from town to town, pulling women, children, and kids, and husbands out of their home to have them stoned, beaten, and killed. You see in the book of Acts and the story of Stephen as Stephen is being stoned by these people and the one holding the coats, the holding the robes of those stoning Stephen is Paul. And when Stephen sees Jesus and he says what he says to Jesus and he falls and he gives up his last breath, Paul looks upon it in approval. This is the man that was traveling to Damascus to kill Christians when he has an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and his life is changed forever. The one who is seeking to destroy the ministry of the gospel becomes the biggest conduit of the ministry of the gospel. His life did not get easy. If anything, his life became progressively difficult. The crowds who used to run with are now the ones who hate him the most. The ones who he used to hunt and kill are the ones who are now skeptical of him. He would experience hardship that's unimaginable by any of us here today. He would experience extreme hunger, extreme persecution, imprisonment. He was shipwrecked. Five times he was beaten within an inch of his life. He experienced isolation. He experienced toil and pain. In this very letter that we call the Philippian letter, he is writing this letter to a church, and he's writing from a prison cell. This man in shackles and chains behind bars writing a beautiful letter of encouragement and rebuke to a church who needs to hear a message. He writes these words. But think about that, for example. Imagine Paul sitting in his prison cell, dependent upon guards to provide him food, dependent upon the church to show up and provide food, to provide clothing, to provide clean stuff. He would send letters with these caregivers to other churches. He would receive letters from other churches. He wanted to know what was going on in the kingdom of God. And this letter comes from him. He goes to the church of Philippi, and this letter says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious. Be content in all things. Paul arrives at this stake of commitment, this mysterious and supernatural commitment that does not make sense to the world. It really, really makes sense to us. But you have to look and see how Paul arrives here, just even looking through the book of Philippians, which I encourage you to do later. The first thing that Paul does when he arrives is he looks back. 
I love chapter 2. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. But he says this in chapter 2. Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name as above every other name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul looks back at the finished work of Jesus, that work that Jesus did upon the cross where he took on the punishment of us, when he took upon the punishment that was from sin and sacrificed himself for us and for Paul. Paul looks back at what Jesus has done, that humiliation that led to his exaltation. He sees the ministry of the gospel, that transformational work that started a church, but also transformed a life of Paul. He looks back and sees his old life, the life before Christ, and sees all that Jesus has done, and he sees himself as extremely supreme. You look in verse 7 of chapter 3, and Paul writes, But whatever were gains to me now, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing, surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider all those things garbage that I may gain Christ will be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith. Paul looks back at Jesus and what he's done for him, and he sees him supremely worth it. He says, all those other things that I've had in my life, all those encounters in my life, all the negativity in my life, all the things that are my difficult and dark past, I consider all those things rubbish. Not just the bad things, even the things I try to gain in this world, the fame, the notoriety. I consider it all rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, my Lord. He looks back, but he also he looks forward. He goes on in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind I strain toward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He decides no longer to dwell on the past sins of his life. He decides no longer to, to, to dwell on the past status of his life. He chooses to press forward and strain forward. I love that word. To strain, to give every ounce of energy that he has to keep pressing forward one step at a time, reaching out, not just for a finish line, but more importantly to Jesus who's on the other side of that line, wanting to take hold of the one who took hold of him and changed his life. And he strains forward, he endures hardship, trial, imprisonment, all for the purpose of being with the one who did everything to be with him. And looking back, he saw what Jesus had done, and looking forward, he could see what Jesus had promised And because of those two things, he was now able to find satisfaction in Jesus no matter what was happening in the moment. As he looked around his current circumstances, again, right from a prison cell, he's like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm not satisfied in these chains, but I am satisfied in my Savior. Even as he's writing from this prison cell to a church, dealing with false teachers and rival teachers, he says, yet I will rejoice. Even as he knows his death could come at any second, He says the words in chapter 1, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Willing and able to step forth into eternity with his Savior. Knowing that he would suffer just as Jesus Jesus suffered, he would do so without grumbling or complaining. Knowing that there were people out there who were against him, he said, I want all of you to consider others more highly than yourself. Highly than myself. Knowing that his goal was ultimately to to know Christ, be found in Christ, and to be made like Christ. He wanted to share in everything Christ went through. His suffering, his death, his life, his resurrection. And after seeing all the sufficiency of Jesus and finding complete satisfaction in Christ, he's able to say the words, rejoice always. I say it again, rejoice. Notice what he does not say. Rejoice in yourself. Rejoice in your circumstances. He's trying to remind these individuals who are dealing with certain things, dealing with persecution, dealing with false teachers. He says, don't just be grateful when things are good. 
Man, it's easy to worship and sing songs on Sunday morning when life is good, amen? He's saying, I want you to be able to rejoice and sing the same songs with the same passion no matter what your circumstances are in that moment. Rejoice in the Lord who's holding all the world together in the palm of his hand when you and I both think the world is falling apart. Rejoice always. And then he says, do not be anxious about anything. Sound good? Sound easy? (laughs) Yeah, right? What Paul's trying to communicate, because this is not easy. He wants us all, you see in Romans chapter 12, he wants our minds to be transformed. A lot of times we focus just on our heart being transformed by the gospel, but our minds need it as well. We need to create new patterns of our mind where we rest in the promises of God and God's word. We long to know what God says, so let's spend time reading what God says and rest in his promises, rest in what he's done, rest in what he's going to do, and find our rest in him. Spending time with him. And as you do so, he says, I want you to present your request, your supplications to God. And do so with thanksgiving, knowing that he cares deeply for you. Sometimes we can get under the impression that our requests are so minor that God doesn't take time to hear that. But we see in Scripture a God who's so invested in his creation. He knows every hair on our head, so then, therefore I know he knows every desire and burden in our heart. Do not believe the lie that your burden is so small. Your father wants to hear from you. He wants to hear you cry out to him, Abba, Father. He wants you to come sit with him and let your burdens go, knowing that his shoulders are big enough because yours aren't. He'll take care of all those things. He knows you so much. He cares for you so deeply that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. And the best part about coming to our Father is that he is willing and able and ready to pour out his abundance upon us. And what he pours out upon us is a peace that surpasses understanding. A peace that is more about fullness and wholeness, not just the absence of conflict. And that begins to transform our hearts, our minds, and it guards them as well. But how do we just hand this over? Like, how do we just hand over our burdens? How do we just hand over our minds? Like Paul, we need to do a course correction with our vision and how we view life, how we understand our minds. And we need to focus on what he's calling us to focus on. He says, I want you to focus on what is true, what's honorable, what's just, what's pure, what's lovely, what's commendable, what's excellent, what's worthy of praise. He says, think on those things. He's saying all those other things you're looking at, the things that bring you pain, that bring you shame, that bring you guilt, stop dwelling on those and focus on what is true. You know, the, the world debates, is it half full or half empty? Which one is it? Anybody? Show your, show your personality type. Half full. All he's trying to say is just be thankful there's a cup in front of you. That's what we're seeing here. It's not about just positive thinking. Just be good that our glass is half full. I'm going to be positive today. Or I'm going to be a pessimist. My glass is half empty. Oh, woe is me. Eeyore. No, it's like I want you to just be thankful that there's a cup before you that God has placed in front of you for a blessing and for an honor for you and a provision for you. He provided honey in a rock. He provided water from a rock. He provided manna from heaven. He wants to provide for you, and he does so every single day. It's a discipline of removing the things in our life that are destructive, the things that are constantly blocking out the glory of God, the things that are constantly blocking out the goodness of God in our life. How many of you have been able to find freedom when you have removed something damaging from your life? Hopefully all of us at some point can say that. And what we're trying to see here, what Paul is trying to communicate to us is that we need to remove the very things that block God because God wants to dwell fully within us. He doesn't want to borrow an empty, or borrow just a, a borrowed space over here. He doesn't want to have just a little bit of room to your side. He wants the fullness of your heart, the fullness of your being, the fullness of your soul so he can dwell within you. Paul knows what it means to be in need. As we've said, he went through persecution. He went through famine and he went through poverty. He knows what it means to be brought low. Man, the man was whipped 39 times, five times. 39 lashes, five times, brought to the point of inches of death. He knows what it means to be brought low. But he also knows what it means to have the abundance. The church of Philippi was a very wealthy and prominent church. 
I know when he was establishing this church that Lydia and the other leaders of that church were providing for him in a great need and providing for him with great comfort and opportunity. He's saying that both extremes, whether I need something or whether I've got everything I need, I'm good. I can be content. Because he knew that Jesus was enough, he knew that in and through the strength of Jesus, he could do all things. Confession here. Middle school basketball. Hot stuff back in the day, middle school, Hamilton, junior high basketball. You know, I was pretty good. No. My favorite player, and I think to this day is the greatest college basketball player, and I will argue up and down that this is true. J.J. Redick played for Duke and Go Blue Devils. J.J. Redick was arguably the best free throw shooter in the history of basketball. I think his career free throw percentage is like 97%. So I thought, well, he's my favorite player. I want to know how to shoot like J.J., right? So I read a study or read an article where he said, I do three dribbles, and then I say Philippians 4.13 to myself, and I shoot. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I will make every single shot because I'll do the three dribbles, and I'll say Philippians 4.13 to myself, and I'll make it because I can do all things through Christ. I can make this basket because I have Jesus. I was not a 97% free throw shooter. I quit basketball because I lost my shot, okay? It ended in middle school terribly. Uh, two and 18 season, I think, was what it ended up being. That wasn't the point, though. That wasn't the point of what he was trying to communicate, but that's also the reason why we take that verse out of context all the time. I can do all things. No, you can't. What Paul is trying to communicate is, like, I can be content in every situation because of Jesus. I can endure every situation because of Jesus. I can have a lot because of Jesus. I can have nothing because of Jesus, but in everything I have all that I need because of Jesus. And it's only in Christ, a word that Paul uses, a phrase that Paul uses repeatedly over and over again in all 13 of his letters, this phrase, in Christ, because the best position you can ever be is in Jesus. And where you find your identity, where you find your purpose, where you find your mission, where you find your calling, in Christ. He says, in Christ, you have all the strength because I am providing you the strength to endure because I've endured, to have joy because I've given you the joy, to have peace because I am the prince of peace. That's what we're trying to communicate, and that's what Paul's trying to say here. Let me ask the question again. Do you have gratitude in your heart this morning? Do you have that contentment in your life? Have you discovered that same secret that Paul found? Because I think, honestly, we need to do exactly what Paul did. First, we need to look back. We need to look back to Jesus. We, we do it twice a month when we talk about communion, but it should be a daily thing. Look back at what Jesus has done for you. Because of Christ, I am, what, Mike? Alive. There's nothing that you and I have done to make that happen. There's nothing that you and I have done to make ourselves free. There's nothing that you and I have done to make ourselves ones who have eternity promised. It's all because of Jesus. We need to look to him regularly, hourly, every second, and be thankful for all that he's done, that he looked upon you, he looked upon me and said, you are worth it. So here's the worth Here's the value that I'm bestowing upon you. I'm going to die for you so that you can have eternity with me. So we need to fix our eyes on him, not just look at the things that are true or honorable. We just need to look to Jesus. All those things can be summarized up by looking at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who's now seated at the right hand of God. He's seated because he's done. His work on earth was finished. Everything that you and I needed to do is now done. And now his Holy Spirit's alive and well within us transforming us every single day. The second thing, we need to look forward to the promise of Jesus ahead. It's easy to get caught up in the mess and the noise of life and say, well, the world's just falling apart. When I think scripture says in Colossians, all things are being reconciled back according to himself and that God is sovereign over all things. So even though things may be spiraling all out in our minds, Everything's working in the plans and sovereignty of good and gracious God. The one who's already written the end of the story. The one who's written a story about a king who's coming back for his church. This church who's not just longing for eternity. Yes, we long for eternity. But now we long to see a king come. And until the time comes that he does come back, we're going to be on mission. We're going to be have, with a purpose. And we're going to serve not just this church, but this community into the very ends of the world. Because we truly believe and live with a sense of urgency like he could come back tomorrow. Knowing that Jesus could come back tomorrow should change your sin life. It should also change the way you serve. It's not just about us. 
There's an entire world who needs to hear the story of Jesus. And when I read Revelation chapter 7, the entire world is going to be bowing down to Jesus one way or another. And I'd rather hear every tribe, tongue, and nation proclaim that he is Lord together in eternity for heaven than in eternity in hell. We need to look backwards at the finished work, to look forwards at the promise of Jesus, knowing that it is kept and unfading, unperishable. It's right there in his hands. And then third, we need to look around now and see what God is doing and shift our focus to him. We sing the song over and over again that even when we don't see it, God is working. You look around in your life now, right now, and you're like, my life is an absolute mess. It might be. That might come as a surprise to you, it might come as a surprise to me, but it actually doesn't come as a surprise to God. That even in that mess, God is still working and orchestrating, and calling, and redeeming, and reconciling, and purchasing what already belongs to him. He's still at work even when you don't see it or feel it. And maybe the best thing for all of us to do is to stop looking around and stop listening to all those things that cause us nothing but pain and anxiety. And start looking to the Prince of Peace, and the person of Jesus. And to rest in his word to spend time with him in prayer, to know the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit of God that's now living inside of you, who's transforming you from the inside out right now. And believing with your entire life, and your entire being, and your entire soul that Jesus is supremely worth it. No matter what it costs. And then finding rest in him. Augustine, the great patron of our faith, once said that we'll never find our rest until we find our rest in thee. We long to rest. When you walk through this life, you just get worn out. You get tired. I'm not talking about just the busyness of life and carting your kids around. Just even this, the anxieties of this world, you get so exhausted. We long to have that rest. But know that, yes, rest is promised eternally. But when Jesus said in his prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's calling us to believe that we can experience that same rest, just a portion of it, right here and right now, because we know that it's going to be eternal. We can experience that hope right now because we're going to have a day where we're not going to need hope anymore. We want to get a taste of heaven right now. Are you rejoicing this morning? Do you have a reason to sing? Do you have a reason to be grateful? Christians, hopefully you can boldly say, three of you said yes. Hopefully you can boldly say, thank you. We should all be singing so loud the goodness of God that the the annoying negativity of this world is being drowned out, not the other way around. We don't want to have a silent God. We don't have a silent God. The, the line of Judah has been roaring for 2,000 years. And the reason why we don't hear him is because we're not being a conduit of that voice anymore. We need to boldly proclaim the goodness of Jesus. Proclaim it over your life. Everyone you meet, you have the transformative power of the gospel in you right now. Live like you've been set free. Live like you've been set free from the gates of hell and run to the world telling them about this mysterious contentment that you now have. That no matter what the circumstances, my life is good because Jesus is so good. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, let me just challenge you. Make today the day because I promise you, you're going to look for satisfaction in a million different ways. And in a million different ways, you're going to be disappointed. The only true source of satisfaction, the only true source of contentment and joy and peace and goodness And love and hope and mercy is only in the person of Jesus. And he was willing to die for you. So let's throw off the shame. Let's throw off the guilt and run and bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace and almighty God. And say, today I I proclaim you as my King, as my Lord. He longs to dwell with you. Would you please consider this morning dwelling with him and open up your life to him so he can fully dwell with you. And all that's required of you is you simply say, Jesus, I believe you're Lord. Make today that day. We'll pray with you. We'll celebrate with you. The person next to you will pray with you and celebrate with you. 
There's not a, a miracle doesn't happen when you walk these steps or walk these few steps up towards the stage. It happens when the Holy Spirit enters your life and begins to do a new and mighty work in you. So collectively, as a church, as a church of Jesus across the entire world, let's start collectively singing a louder song, one that sounds less like the world and one that sounds more like the people of God who've been pulled out of darkness and into marvelous light. Let's make sure that our gratitude is not a lost art amongst us. It's not a lost art amongst the redeemed people who have an eternity of reasons to be thankful. I couldn't find that in the All right, Siri. She said I couldn't find. She couldn't find the joy, I guess. You got a reason to be silent. Yeah. But let's make sure. Wow, how do you come back from that one? Let's make sure that we are people of gratitude and thankful. I stand before you today extremely thankful for the last five years of my life. I'm extremely thankful for what my wife and I have experienced for these last five years. I'm more thankful of Jesus who came and died for me to redeem me, who redeemed my wife, and who's redeemed you. I want you, above all else, to know and worship him. I don't worry about what happens to me. I could be gone tomorrow, and that's fine. I want all of us to be together in eternity with Jesus, worshiping one another and have the biggest family reunion we've ever seen in this world. So my prayer over you is simply this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters here today in this room and online, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at the last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. And hopefully we can all agree we've learned to be content in whatever situation or circumstance. We all know what it means to be in need. We all know what it is to have plenty. We all have learned together this morning, hopefully, the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or given or, or in want. We Faith family, we can do all things through him who gives us the strength.